We're live here in the studio, New John Simmons Show. Here, our guest, Vera Clay, a good friend of mine, has joined us in the studio. Vera, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, John? I'm so thankful you finally made it down here to the basement. Yes, yeah. nice studio. Thank you. So uh, you work for the police station. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you call it that. So. Uh, St. Louis County Police Department. <laughs> yes, the yes. St. Louis County Police Department. And tell us what your role is there. Uh, my role is a digital and social media coordinator. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people say, well, <laughs> that might be your title, but we do a lot more uh, with the public information office and then a lot of uh, crisis communications, which I love. Yeah, cr communications, though. You uh, you also have a background. You worked at the uh, Katie Nell or fox or which which yep, channel was it at, i actually both i used to i started my t television career at um channel 11 in st louis and then moved over to uh ktvi which would be the fox 2 uh what, what people know now is fox 2 news and then um it was weird because then the two combined oh yeah and it was it was like just really a mind warp because like, oh, am I in the same place again? <laughs> so yeah, I did that and I was in TV for, I think, 15 years. Wow. Uh, so how'd you get into sort of that field? Oh boy. Um, so I always knew I wanted to... Push this up a little bit closer. Sure. Um, I was, um, I remember writing a speech in sixth grade. Oh yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember writing a speech in sixth grade and giving the speech in front of like an assembly or something. And I had a teacher who said, you would be a great journalist. And I'm like, what's a journalist? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh -huh. you know, just learning that that was a news reporter. And really from there, that sparked my interest. And I would do things like the yearbook uh, in high school. And at one point, I think we had like a little paper. I was a sideline reporter for our football team over wow. at uh, East St. Louis Senior High School. So, and that just took me right into uh, the University of Illinois where I got into the communications program and majored in broadcast journalism. So how I got there from the police department, I don't yeah. know, but, <laughs> but, it, but so since you were a young girl, sounds like you sort of had this DNA. Now I remember when I was in high school, like if you were on the yearbook staff, like you were, you were not like the coolest kid, but you had like, you got to carry the camera. You got to sort of walk around school and like people knew who you were and like people were sort of like, Hey, put me in there. Superlatives and all that kind of stuff. You know, was that, <laughs> was that sort of uh, what was going on with you? Um, I think that may have had something to do with it. And, um, the fact that I was in, um, I was in the first track. I was a valedictorian of my high school. Shut class. up. Vera Clay. <laughs> I, no, I, was. I didn't know. I, I didn't. Well, come on. Yes. You're the smart girl, huh? <laughs> Stop it, John. Why? No, I want to so, know. So I look. I don't know many valedictorians, so I need to know that how how this works. You get good grades. And you. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of a. I, I was a pretty ambitious. Like you know, it goes with the people please, and I think you're being the firstborn, so you want to do everything right, and so. That was me, and I, I loved the, you know, hey, you're doing a great job, and I loved getting the good grades, and yeah. so I ended up as a valedictorian of the class, so I think that That's awesome. there's, you know, you're in a, a track where people kind of know who you are, and yeah, I I was like in the choir, and you know, yeah, on the on the yearbook staff and that kind of stuff. So I guess I would I was known, but yeah. I don't feel like I was popular. It, it's making more sense. Like it, the more you say of all the things in the activities you were involved in, mm -hmm. this is very like valedictorian <laughs> material. Like I was in the choir, I was in the band. We're I not even going to talk about <laughs> Beta Club and the Honor drama Society. Yeah, then, all that stuff. Right. And the drama club, <laughs> yes, did high school plays. So you did a little bit of everything, and that's really the high mm -hmm. achiever uh, mentality that a valedictorian generally. Yeah, good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah, for me, for me, I was like, uh, by the time I was in junior year, I dropped out of basically everything except radio because that's the only thing I wanted to do. Okay. But uh, I looked at the people who were up there, and I was like, I got good grades, but not good enough. You know what I'm saying? And I, I never, I just never liked studying. I never liked getting that book open at the end of. At and home. I loved it. Yeah. I like even now. I I want to know that I know. Yeah. that I know. And I'm like, Oh, what's this? Even with the Bible, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> this came to me. Let me, I need like four Bibles and versions <laughs> all and the highlighters out. where to find it. And my husband <laughs> probably comes in like, why do you have all these books on the bed? <laughs> because I'm reading one verse. <laughs> so, I gotta have it. The concordance. Yep. Gotta have it. Yeah. I remember when I, I was working at the bookstore when I first got born again and they had all the concordances on the shelf and I was like, 
what are these things? Mm-hmm. And then these, just one after another, these pastors would roll in and buy these little, these big old thick books. And I'd like, the flip strong, yeah, the strong, like yeah, this big. And so I got one because they, you know, they had some like, there was, they're like, you can take these. And I was like, I'm gonna take them. I'm gonna get smart with the Bible. And I opened that sucker up and my, my, my high schooler came out and was just like, <laughs> shut that thing as close nope, as you can. We're going to Google this. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. I'm just going to go to church and let a pastor tell me what that word is. Yeah. So, <laughs> so communications, though. Uh, so you got to give the speech then, right? Mm-hmm, I did. Tell me. Oh, my. <laughs> I was so nervous. And it was a weird year because our school district had gone on strike in 1998. So we were out of school for like the first month of the school year. So we didn't graduate until June. It was actually June 25th. Uh-huh. And I remember because it was my mom's birthday. And I remember having to write the the speech and I remember it had something to do with, you know, us facing the challenge of being out and still pressing for it. And I remember using the term in my valedictorian speech, press down, shaking together. Oh, no, over. you didn't. I did. I was the PK. I'm a <laughs> kid. So, I mean, it was part of me, but outside of that, I don't remember much. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you know. Well, I appreciate that part of it. So you grew up a uh, pastor's kid, for those who don't know what PK means, yep. right? So uh, was this the reason you were so uh, overachieving at school and things? Because you had a great foundation and the Bible and they were taking you to church and things like that? You know what? I don't know. I think it may have more to do with me being the oldest child. I probably of how many? A, of four. Yeah. Um. So I was the oldest of four. So I had three younger brothers, but I love to tell the story that I also had like three older kind of adopted brothers because the church we went to was just like a huge family. And we had a lady, her name was Jean. I call her aunt Jean. And she had three sons and Willie, Tyree and Carlos, and they were always with us. And so I, I'd say that because I don't remember much without them. Yeah. And so our house, I'm the only girl. Oh no. Yeah, I'm the only girl. So there were always boys <laughs> and they were just baseball. My dad was the boys yeah. um, Sunday school teacher. And so he would always have the boys and put them in the station wagon and we'd go to Jones Park and oh. they'd be playing baseball or we, we just had such a huge um, youth group mm-hmm. at church that most of the time the boys ended just up the cousins, in our house. Basically, yeah. Yes, cousins, <laughs> uh, just everybody. And, you know, black people are the, the cousins that we, <laughs> we made our family. So um, just being in that environment, I think... I was the only girl, so I just did well, I guess, maybe just wired that way, yeah. but, you know. So what was it like growing up, your parents preaching? Oh, um, so <laughs> a preacher's kid, again, we had a very large youth group at church, and so we grew up Pentecostal, Pentecostal and Church of God in Christ, so my dad's part of the family. Are those things was- not normally related? I don't know. Um, they're very, they're similar. They're all Christian, um, Christian religions. Um, but, um, church of God in Christ is one denomination. Pentecostal is a dom- denomination, mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. like Baptist. And, sure. Know. And I've heard of both of those. And I, you know, correct. You know. So Pentecostal, it was, it was much more strict. Um, you wear the skirt down to oh, your the real Pentecostal yep. Not, yeah, okay. uh, head covers in church. You put something on long mm-hmm. sleeves, you know, you wear the robe and when you're going to sing. And so, um, it was definitely, uh, uh, an experience that when you're growing up, it's just like, this is what you do, but it was also very fire and brimstone. Like you're going to hell. Yes. Today, probably. Yep. <laughs> if you don't get right. It was. And I, I, love, to, I love to say, I appreciate the experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but in, in, um, when you get older and you go through spiritual growth, you're like, I'm pretty sure God's not going to send me to hell because I went to a football game on a Friday night yeah. instead of going to church. Yeah. And so growing up, um, as a PK, you really have to reconcile. So it's your parents telling you, you're going to hell too. No. <laughs> no. My, and the thing is my parents were not, oh. <laughs> my parents were very cool, but the church that we were in oh. was very strict. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Like we couldn't go to the movie theaters. You did not listen to, you know, 
I think back then it was like Magic 108. Oh, yeah. MTV you know, was not allowed. Nope, no. you, you didn't do any of that things. But the, I think the downside of it is you also didn't talk about things. And so oh. there were no questions. You don't question. Nope, this is what we do and this is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But my parents were not like that. They were like, well, this is this is the ministry that we're in and this is what we sit up under. But I'm telling you, John, it was such an education that I just, I, I appreciate it, but there had to be a moment where you found your own relationship with God and walk with Christ. Because while there was a lot of, um, do this, do that, or don't do this and mm -hmm. don't do that. My questions weren't a answered as to why, um, we, we, so you, I, I almost, it's almost like you get to a certain point where you have to make sure that I am, um, I'm saved because I'm saved and not because I grew up this way mm -hmm. or this is routine or this is just what you do that because this is our religion and you actually have to make sure you form a relationship with Christ. And so that was definitely a struggle. I think growing up as a preacher's kid, because it was either, it felt like it could be all or nothing. You're either yeah. saved or you're not, there's no gray. And then if you mess up, you need to stand up in front of the whole church and repent oh. and, yeah, no. <laughs> right. So when did your parents become pastoral in that in that role? So um, my dad, he was always a minister from what I could recall. Yeah. And he was very active in church. Oh, I just, uh, I, that's what I remember. And then. You say, ugh, because you had to be there all the time. And you was like. No, no. I said, ugh, because oh. it was just like, it was actually i guess it was nice yeah oh okay all right. <laughs> i'm telling you i am like i am like the model of goody two shoes so yeah. <laughs> like well we can't wait until she messed up <laughs> uh, the valedictorian they were, they were glad yeah. mm -hmm. they were glad but um I'm, I'm just trying to remember my dad became uh, a pastor i believe um somewhere around uh oh four Four oh five. I honestly cannot recall, and that's so you were out of high school. Oh yeah, yeah. So he had been ministering for a very long time in between the the Pentecostal church that we had started in, and then he transitioned over to the Church of God in Christ, where his family was, and my uncle was the pastor, and then he became the assistant pastor, and then he was he's very active in the Church of God in Christ. It's like um, whatever our district is over there, I don't recall, uh, but um, so yeah, he became a pastor maybe in the early uh, 2000s, okay. that's what I think. Yeah, and so their influence on you has carried over into everything. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. their influence has been just um, from the beginning um, with um, whether it's singing, um, going to church. Another thing on your bucket list of activities you've participated oh, in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> singing. Um, I, I think that's probably where it started because my dad was very, he's very into music, gospel music. So yeah. growing up, I heard Minor Summers and I heard uh, Thomas A. Dorsey and all of these. I'll take your word for it. Though. Right. <laughs> all of these old school, like, so I grew up on choirs and singing and yeah. I used to stand in um, the hallway when I was little, I remember standing in the hallway and I could see this big, huge choir ah. and I would conduct them. But my dad tells me, I don't remember this part. He said, if you walk down the hallway, I would start crying, go, you're stepping on my choir. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so, so I've always been like a, you like, killed the front row. I, I, I yeah. know. <laughs> the most interesting part about that is um, once I got to college, I was in the University of Illinois Black Chorus to 150 200 mm -hmm. voice choir and i was asked to conduct and i completely forgot about what i did when i was like yeah. four and i stepped onto the stage to conduct the choir and the holy spirit showed me the hallway, the hallway. Mm -hmm. and i was like oh my god i'm doing it <laughs> <laughs> Was that, uh, so yeah, so let, that, that sort of leads to what I wanted to ask you about. Cause you said like you had a lot of questions at some point in your relationship with God. And so it, and that sort of goes against your sort of like, I got the concordance and all the four mm -hmm. Bibles out and I'm trying to study the word. Like, so at some point you got yourself in a position where you were uh, deeper in your walk or you, you got some of those questions answered. So what was it? How did you sort of switch to that new 
way of thinking or new way of looking? Um, I think it had a lot to do with, I, you know, I, I, I knew what being saved was at least through, um, you know, what that walk was supposed to look like. But I also knew, okay, you can wear a long skirt and you can do this and that, and you're not living yeah. like Christ. Like what, are, what, why are we doing this? I still ask, I'm, I'm 42 and I'm like, what, why are we doing this? Yeah, yeah. And a lot like of your it, life at home is messed up, but you still got the skirt on, yeah. on Sundays. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. And I think it was more about like inside I knew God was real. Um, I knew very early. I think one of the first times I knew God was real was um, <laughs> back to my dad. Uh, there was a, a kind of a tragedy at our church where uh, two young kids, they, um, they got electrocuted and, mm. and they died Whoa. in their home. And I was, I was so sad and I could not stop crying mm. and my dad was trying to console me and he says daughter you have to ask God to help you to not be sad in a very I might have been eight then yeah. and he said you have to ask God to help you not be sad and to take away the sorrow and I did that and I remember the peace and I remember when it was like oh my God at work God is real. Yeah. And so when with the, the choir, um, re the, the choir um, example, when I stepped on that platform, it was not like, oh, I'm remembering something that happened. It was the Holy Spirit. And I didn't know at the time that I had a perceiver gift. Yeah. And at the time, there had been things that had happened that I would look around and go, did anybody else hear that? Right, anybody yeah. else see that? And I had to learn with the help of my dad, um, again, ah. <laughs> that guy's just my favorite. <laughs> um, I would dream and I would go, um, I would go, oh my gosh, I was in college and I had a dream. And this is how my dad got from our Pentecostal church to the church of God in Christ. I had this dream and there was something going on at the church and someone had, um, the pastor had taken a different wife and there was just this uproar, but I'm looking at, but you know, the scene was changing and I called my dad because by now I'm 18 and I've, I've learned, I better tell him about these dreams. Yeah. And I called him and I said, I had this dream and this happened and this person and that person. And he said, Oh, daughter, I got to tell you what's happening here. And he told me, and it wasn't directly our church but it was one of our sister churches and it basically was the same dream with different players and so knowing that i've always been very sensitive to okay if god is showing me things and god is telling me things john i remember every time the lord told me to tell someone something mm -hmm. or show me a dream and i didn't do it and i Sticks didn't like that you. oh my goodness i didn't like that feeling yeah. so carrying that made me want a deeper relationship. Why are you showing me these things? Why am I the one? And so you, you want to be right. You want to make sure, okay, I'm, am, am I some sort of messenger? Am I, mm -hmm. and yeah, I had to learn what that gifting was. And that led me to be more of, I don't want to just be the girl who grew up in the Pentecostal church. I want to know that I'm saved. I want to know when I pray, God hears me because you definitely telling yeah, me things. Yeah. So how, how do I make this a deeper walk? And it just came down to making a decision. Yeah. So I love the perceiver gift for one, for, for one, because I'm walking a hundred percent in my perceiver gift oh, at all times. It's such a responsibility. And for those who maybe don't understand what we're talking about, so mm -hmm. uh, Romans 12 motivational gifts. So mm -hmm. there's like uh, administration, perceiver, uh, giver, mercy, server, mm -hmm. uh, teacher. So we've got these different gifts that, uh, so basically everybody gets at least one primary gift and you right. often walk in m multiple gifts and you can also Correct. mature those gifts. You might be walking in two or three or maybe in four. Jesus walked in all seven. Uh, and he's the perfect example of all of them. But, uh, uh, for most of us, one gift is 
probably our primary gift. Mm-hmm. And, and most gifts, most people have mercy as that's the primary gift that ha- gets handed out. So just love and compassion on people. Uh, but perceiver gifts, this is like a communication gift. People who, who communicate yeah. often, it's it's like the if, if you if you look at the gifts, those motivational gifts as parts of the body, like perceivers of the mouth. <laughs> so not surprised that you got put in valedictorian role oh, in your boy. communications and all this. But what you're describing about seeing dreams and visions from God. That might be unusual. Some people were talking about, but it's a thing. Oh. <laughs> it's a thing. So yes. I can remember the first time that uh, this experience happened to me, changed my entire life. So uh, I had just been born again, maybe a, a month or two at this point, and I started having these really weird dreams. And I started writing them down because I was like, I never had dreams like this yep. before my whole Can't life. Write it down. Yeah. And so I started writing them down. And, and at this point, by the by the way, guys, like I have like uh, probably ten thousand documents on my computer of like all these dreams. And I don't want anybody to read this even after I'm gone. But this is just yeah, I this get is it. my journal here of all the dreams that I've had. But one of the first dreams I wrote down. Uh, was a conversation that I had with my brother about Jesus. Now, me and my brother, my whole family, by the way, like we went to church a few times growing up, but we were not in the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if my family was saved. I, you know, we, we didn't discuss Jesus. It wasn't a conversation. You just went to church we a went, couple times. Yeah. So like when I was younger, my grandma used to take me, but that was like the extent of it. Right. Uh, after my dad died when I was 12, I never went back until I was an adult. So uh, the point is, is that when I got born again, had this dream, I was talking to my brother and then I got saved in September, and so at Thanksgiving is when this conversation happened. And we're sitting around after Thanksgiving dinner, so it's coming up on like the tenth anniversary of this conversation, okay. this dream. Uh, and I'm sitting in the living room, and my mom is so. At, hold on, yeah. You had the dream before you were saved. No, I had. The, so I got saved in September. I had a dream sometime between September and Thanksgiving. So okay. in that in that two month window, okay, I had started getting dreams, and this was the dream that I was that I had had about this conversation. Mm-hmm. So we're at, dinner's over, we're in the living room, and my mom, who knows that I just got born again, is mm-hmm. like asking me some questions about it. You know, like what's going on with your life and this sort of thing. And like, because I'm an addict, I've been an addict for ten years, and all Correct. of a sudden, like I'm thinking differently, I'm talking differently. I'm at Thanksgiving, like I wouldn't even come to Thanksgiving the last ten years. They're you know? like, so, who's this <laughs> Jesus you've been hanging out? Exactly with? right, and that's the questions that are coming up. People are talking about you. Now, my grandma has been saved. She was in the AG church her whole life, tongue talking. Mm-hmm. Like, if I I've been to her church a couple times, and I was like, right, what are they doing <laughs> over there in a the corner? They stand up and hoppity but and I was like, what's going mm-hmm. on? You know? So I'd seen some weird things and some different things in my life so i wasn't like entirely like uncultured mm-hmm. uh like i didn't know anything but uh this was definitely an experience like dreams and stuff nothing none of that had ever right. been ex- explained to me so all of a sudden i'm talking to my mom and then everybody starts jumping in this conversation and then my brother jumps in the conversation he's like and i think and i and i said something like you know i just feel like i need to tell people about jesus now i feel like that it's what god wants me to do right you know and he's like well wh- what gives you the right to tell people about jesus mm. my brother's been in catholic church and, and saved uh, you know for a while he, he converted for his wedding it's so, like i was confused a little bit like what wh- what are you saying this and and we continue in this conversation and all of a sudden like you said in the hallway you know where you had the picture yep. of what was happening like i was like i felt this blanket of what, like god was saying this was the the dream like the word for, like I, I had written down some of those things that yep. were and i was like Ah, like I, I started crying in the room in front of everybody. Like I was so overwhelmed with emotion, yes. so overwhelmed that I was like, I got to go. Like in the middle, of, we're in the middle of a conversation. I was like, I got to get out of here. This weird thing is happening to me right now. Right. And I run outside. I'm talking about Thanksgiving. All oh, my family's there. I'm being so weird right now. <laughs> I'm being like, where's he going? <laughs> Why is he start crying? And so, uh, I get in my car to leave. My brother stands behind the car. This is like a movie, like a say anything or something. I look in the rear view. I see him. It's like raining outside. And he's like, I didn't mean to offend you or nothing. You just need to come inside or whatever, you know? And so I was like, all right. So I come back inside and we're sitting there for a minute. And my brother apologizes again. He's just like, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to stir nothing up or whatever. And I looked at him. And I go, it's not me that cries for you. It's the Holy Spirit. Now, I've never said anything like that in my entire <laughs> life. And I'm like, that I don't even know what that means. Like, I'm talking about, like, I have you. I barely opened the Bible. Right. Like, <laughs> there ain't no Christian in me. I'm just walking this out for the oh, first wow. time. And, like, all of a sudden I'm ministering in a way that I never experienced. But from that moment on, I started tracking all the dreams. Yep. And I started seeing dreams come true. God would reveal people that I would meet, people who would come in contact with me. And I, and it's just so strange to experience that. Correct. And so at first, um, I'm sure it was, I used to be, a, 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 I, I'm, I'm pausing because I don't want to say afraid, but it was, it was rattling because you're like, am I supposed to tell anyone yeah. this? And you're writing it down. And a lot of times now when I um, when I encourage people who tell me things like that, I'm like, write it down when when it comes up, 
you will know right away. Yes. The Lord will bring it back to your remembrance right away. Um, so were you ever like, I was fearful until I learned what was happening. Were you fearful? Yeah, I, was, I tried. I ran. I was crying. I was <laughs> like, this is, this is the weirdest <laughs> thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. It, I, like I had no... I had nothing to measure it against. It never happened before. Correct. I had no one who had taught this to me before. Right. And when I said it, when I started this conversation, I said it changed my life. Yeah. Because it, when that happened, I was like, "What? What on earth happened?" You know. Yeah. And, so, and somebody was like, "Well, it's probably receiver gift or however it got explained to me." And uh -huh. so I was like, "I got to figure this out." You know. And so I went on a deep dive into understanding motivational gifts. And when I finally came across the understanding of receiver, and it would explain like it's like a uh, inventory list test basically is how you do this Correct. and so that's how i found out but then through the, the study of that course and the teacher who was teaching it described like the personality traits associated with this gift and what you, what your dreams mean for you in ministry and what mm -hmm. uh, and, and why you think the way you think and why you don't have many friends and why you know you sort of come off as really less empathetic than other people and like all these different things right and i was like he's explaining me <laughs> right because and so growing up in church and it, i don't know if it was just a, a um if it may have just been how we describe things, people would say you have an old soul or you're sensitive yeah. to the spirit or you're a dreamer. Um, but there were things that were happening and I was not asleep. Um, I remember um, I talked about a little bit about my older brothers. I knew he was going to pass away. I did not know how uh, he was gonna pass away. Yeah. I knew sitting in service one night, the pastor said something and I thought, why would you say that to a group of kids? Um, I'm purposely not repeating what he said. It wasn't bad. It was just, it was just like one of us was, would, would pass away. And I thought that's a terrible thing to say, but I knew that it was going to be Willie. I knew it. Mm. Um, but he didn't die for a few years later. And when it happened, mm. I was so angry at God because it's like, why did you tell me that? Yeah. Why did you do that? Um, and of course, you know, we went on and, and through his death, there were so many kids from that same group that came back and gave their life to Christ or whatever. But I, I was, I was not prepared to bear that perceiver gift responsibility yeah. and when these things would happen i'd be like why do i have to do that i was i was in a church and the lord showed me something that had to do with a friend of mine and another young lady and the holy spirit said sit in between them he showed me exactly what was going on and i got up and i sat in between them so when she revealed to me later what was going on i was not surprised and i was starting to learn okay you're giving me the heads up yeah I don't know what to do with it's this. It's like a nudge. Talk yeah. to my dad. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got to the spirit church, Pastor Tracy was doing a lesson. Um, she was ministering. I think it was a Sunday. And I think she had a board and she was just showing, like breaking down what all of those giftings were. Yeah. And it was like, oh my God, it that has a name. Yes. It has a name. And that's when I was like, oh, this is what I am. Thanks a lot, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, but it's yeah. eye-opening. It's revelation it knowledge when you discover, because the, the gift is called motivation, mm -hmm. motivational gift. Like when you understand your gift, you're motivated to wake up every day, excited to do something, excited to yeah. go where God wants you to, because you understand why now. And and then you know what to do with it. Yes. And I, I, now, I understand the difference now, things I'm supposed to hold on to, yeah. things I'm supposed to report right away. Yeah. And there have been times where I'm like, I don't want to go tell pastor <laughs> that. I don't want to say that. Yeah. But you do it because it's part of your gifting and it's part of being obedient because you realize that God is using you as a vehicle in yeah. a different kind of way. People walk up and say, oh, did you know such and such? And I'm like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. If I told you, you would have thought I was crazy because exactly. it was a year ago. Yeah. But so, yeah. Yeah, and so like it's like if you're if you're a server gift, I'm just gonna sort of uh, explain this a little bit for people who don't understand. So like a server gift, like you might be a church or anywhere, and you might be like, uh, you know, 
the event's over and you hop up without being asked and you're trying to put the chairs away and you're like, hey, yeah. can I help with the tables? Hey, can I clean up the dishes or whatever it is? Like, that's your gift coming out. And it's like, when we're talking about having dreams and stuff, like, that's just part of our gifting coming out. Correct. You know? And if you're a giver and you're like the first person to get up during the altar call and drop some money in the bucket and the rest of us are like, I don't know about this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're probably a giver. <laughs> you know, but God will give you the, God will bless you usually with enough finances to be able to do that on a bigger scale than most of us. So right. it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's another part of that gift. Uh, oh, boy. It's so uh, exciting. <laughs> And so it really is. It's really uh, when you understand why God made you the way you did, because you use that gift to minister to others, to encourage others. And for me, when I started to walk in this, it was like, okay, so God wants me to minister to people. That's my mm -hmm. number one. My one, He called me into ministry, even though I was like, what's a ministry? You know, <laughs> I don't even know what that means. And I'm like, you go ahead and talk. I'll just <laughs> sit back here. <laughs> you do that. Yeah. But what do you do as a new believer when you're experiencing things and you're like, Hey, uh, I'm having these dreams. Like you, you, you had the luxury of being able to go to your dad and having him walk through stuff with you. I didn't have that. I was just yeah. very confused out there in the world. That's why it even took a minute now to explain it because if people are out there and they don't understand the motivational gift, it changed my life understanding right. that. And so when you found out you were a perceiver, what, what was next for you? Like, do you remember like going to Tracy after past Tracy afterwards and being like, I went to, um, yep, I did. And then I went to, um, I took the Y steps classes because yeah. I wanted to, learn and then um about them more and then when i took the test i was like perceiver server yeah like almost neck what and neck. changed in your life as far as your way of thinking so like now you see the world differently because you see it through your perceiver lens and you understand what that perceiver lens is um probably just being so much more aware that god is present uh real and listening listening to the holy spirit being sensitive to what's happening around us always being able to go and and everything ain't up for perception be oh, like, that's true okay too. there's yeah, it's just Sometimes a table <laughs> calm down you know we you know we tell a joke back in the you know the kojic church be like people blame the devil for everything oh, be yeah. like i got my lights turned off the devil is busy <laughs> no you didn't pay your light bill <laughs> this ain't got nothing to do with satan um so so being able to you know discern yeah um and really the responsibility that comes along with all of our giftings and our responsibility to walk in those in obedience to Christ so that we are successful in our lives and in, in, in our spiritual growth. Because if you don't, um, if you're, I think it'd be really hard to ignore your gifts, yeah. but if you're not, or you're being slowful, um, I don't think that bodes well for you when you start trying to do things in, in the natural world because you're still you you could be you know risking walking in disobedience yeah. and not living the life that God has set for for you and like I said before there are times where I knew I was supposed to say certain things or tell certain things I remember them to this day yes, that, and I don't like it oh no that's one of the I'm gonna get this off me. <laughs> As fast as you can, because that's how it is for me, because yeah. like, I'll get like, you need to go, you need to go tell that person something. And if I don't, like, I still think about Why? stuff that happened like 18 years ago. And I'm like, I wasn't even saved back then. But I'm like, that was just like my, my attitude. Like I can remember in the fifth grade, I broke this little girl's doll set or whatever. And I was over her house playing and that guilt is, it's like the conviction of a perceiver. Mm -hmm. We always judge ourselves more than we judge others. Uh, our internal conviction is way higher than yeah. uh, uh, many of the other giftings, you know, like yeah. we will be the first one to rebuke ourselves even uh, for our attitude right. or our way of thinking or something, doing something wrong. But it's also like we come at others and we're like, y'all need to watch what you're doing. <laughs> you I know. So you have to be very careful not to be judgy, I know, especially right? if the Lord shows you something and you like, mm, what they, nope, you yeah. gotta, yeah. you have to just kind of hold on to it and, and pray. Yeah. You need to pray for that person. That's one of the things that they call us to intercessory prayers. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, and I love intercessory prayers. Mm -hmm. Uh, pray for that person, pray yep. for the situation. And if you're not this, Hey, that's not, that's not my business. This is what I'm supposed to do with this, um, with this information. So yeah. just being obedient, being sensitive. And then I think, uh, like you said earlier, you know, with mercy, you become very, um, you'd be like, yeah, we know all got to see it. Let's not act like, you know, <laughs> we the cats meow, you know, it's like the Lord has shown me what someone has done. 
I don't need him showing nobody yeah. <laughs> what I have done. Yeah. So you go, you are able to really have have some mercy. Oh, indeed. And in fact, you can see, like you said, like it's like um, you can see your gifts in you even if you don't understand what they are yet. Like mm -hmm. I see my kids now because, well, for one, I'm looking for it. But like my little two-year-old Maisie, uh, anytime one of my other kids falls down or something, she runs right over to him. Are you okay? Do you need anything? She'll like mm -hmm. put, she'll lay her little hand on their knee and be like, Jesus name healed. And she'll like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but she's walking in that. None of my other kids do that. Right. <laughs> you know? like she's walking in her mercy gift and it's easy to demonstrate. Uh, and even at a young age, like why you are like my, my daughter though. So this is my little perceiver. She is like a mere image of me in personality. At least she will, uh, she's my corrector. I call her. You know, because uh, I can't get away with nothing. I'll be like, I'll be like, hey, can uh, y'all get in the car? She'd be like, you mean the van? Like, I mean, I cannot get away with anything. I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> exactly right. Yo, get yourself in it. <laughs> and uh, I'm often like, you know, my pet, my pet peeve is when someone corrects me over dumb stuff. But it's like, that's what I'm called to do a little bit. Like, it's like, y'all, y'all watching that porn? Get off the porn. Y'all doing this? Get off the, you know, y'all cheating mm -hmm. on your wife? Stop cheating on your wife. Like, it's like, I, I'm the first one to say something to right. somebody. And so my little corrector, she has just been uh, my whole life, Vera. She is Keep just, us grounded. Oh, God bless her. But, uh. I love the gifts though, and it really did make a big impact in my in my walk, mm -hmm. you know. And it sounds like it did for you. Oh, absolutely! At just absolutely, it's been um, you know kind of a game changer because then you know kind of what your purpose is. Yeah. You know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing in the in the kingdom because I, I like to talk about gifts and talents. Yeah. And so there are some things we are talented at. Sure. I don't even know. I, and I have to be careful. I'm like, I don't even know if I'm explaining this right. If there's some scholar out there, just like, well, no, they're intertwining. You read a couple things, but I'm like, there are some talents that, you know, we can, we can be trained to do. We can pull off. And, and then you have uh, some, some in, in, intuitive things that just come naturally to yeah. you. And I think those are giftings. And yep. so I just am just grateful to be able to, learn in the last several years all right this is what this is how i'm built this is how the lord is trying to use me this is how um i can be of service or blessing yeah. in you know the kingdom and, and the good it does for my life just by being obedient yeah obedience is huge <laughs> yeah it's 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 something that I'm, I'm still walking in trying to walk out submission and authority and things like that because i've you know uh somebody brought to my attention like I've never had an authority figure, you know, it's mm -hmm. like I spent my entire adult life, you know, my dad died when I was little. I had no one in my life who was really like correcting me over and over and over yeah. again, like always like getting on me about doing something bad. I just sort of did whatever I wanted to. And so I get in the kingdom of heaven. It's like God convicts me, starts convicting me of sin heavy because I'm a perceiver. I start to like throw away the gambling addiction mm -hmm. and smoking and cursing and all that stuff starts to go out the window. But walking in Christianity for 10 years, you, you, you know, you start walking in some stuff you don't maybe you know, just pride or arrogance, Correct. Or, you know, and it's like those invisible ones. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, I ain't cheating on my wife, yeah. but I can't really stand you. Exactly. It don't work. <laughs> and so I'm still walking in like, how do you get some of that off you? You know? And so I've been walking in submission and authority, trying to understand that. And it's been very difficult, uh, a, a journey for me because that conviction gets so heavy, but it's also like the, the walking it out. It's not always easy. Right. And so then when, and I think the, the mistake that uh, people make is not, forgiving themselves yeah. do you ever feel like okay i made a mistake are you worried about like okay now what are people gonna think about me and yeah well I, it's constantly a thought in my mind like i can't fall and go back and gamble because i will lose my entire testimony like mm -hmm. everything anybody's ever seen me done it'll just like be washed away almost you know it's like mm -hmm. and that to me is like it's 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 a good and a bad because one we've been given enough grace that like, even if I fell, like God can restore me and, right. and, and that sort of thing, you know, but from the eyes of the world, like I would just lose any credibility that I had in terms of, you know, being able to witness to somebody moving forward in that right. area. The natural, um, I think it was Pastor T.D. Jakes. He says, we have, we our, our amnesia comes so quickly <laughs> um, when we are, you know, believers, but someone messes up and it's like, oh, well, yep. they, they, I, I mean, even to the point where it's just like, we have to be so careful about how we judge people lest yeah. we be judged. And yeah. so, um, I, it's hard for me. I, I have like, there's a, there's a line between judging someone and trying to help someone out of a situation that they're in because mm -hmm. maybe they're not interpreting the Bible in the way that the black and white perceiver might be perceiving it. Right. So, mm -hmm. so how do you come, come off without being uh, judgy? Right. And that's a, a line to walk. You gotta learn how to walk it. 
Yeah, you have to ask the Lord to help you with that. Yeah. And it's like, hey, you know what? That's their life. God is working on them. They have they have to walk their own journey, and I walk mine. And we're our responsibility is to love and pray for people. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't know the times where someone said, "Oh, this person's back on drugs again," and they come back to the church and they do. They do fine, and people still like. Well, just don't pass them the collection plate. You oh know my goodness! Yeah. And so you you have we have to be so careful because in the middle of all of that is Satan. His job is to steal, kill, and destroy. Whether that is relationships, yeah. whether that is trust, whether that is whatever it is, and so it's just such a a careful walk that you just you really have to, you know, really die daily. Oh. And you, you, you die daily and go, okay, we're going to try this, try this again and make sure I'm <laughs> forgiven. And I'm not smoking, but I'm not forgiven. Yeah. I'm not drinking, but I'm, you know, maybe prideful. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Have you been able to realize uh, since you've discovered your gift, how to use it in your day-to-day -day work, like at the, at, at the police force? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more. Um, so what I, uh, so that is kind of twofold. I'm also, um, an, an, a self-professed introvert and that's so, all perceivers, by the way, oh, man, see, I love figuring out who I am. Yep. Um, and so at first, again, even with the perceiver gift, with the introversion, I thought there was something wrong with me because sometimes I can't speak right away yep. when real realizing it's just processing the way I process mm -hmm. things. Um, and so at work, I used to be very afraid to speak up. I would have great ideas, but they didn't come until like 30 minutes after the meeting. I'm like, why didn't I yeah. say this? Why didn't I say that? And I started to learn a couple of tricks um, just in, you know, reading about introversion. Even when I realized that and I read about what that was, I was like, oh, my God, I found my people. <laughs> um, <laughs> but using that gift um, to go, okay. I don't have an answer for you right now, but let me go back and think about it instead of feeling like I should be on the spot. You know, some people are very able to go uh, back and forth really quickly, mm -hmm. like quick on their feet. And I'm like, can I just go take a brain break and I'll get back to you in 30 minutes and I'll have like this elaborate <laughs> <Yeah>. plan. <laughs> but at work, um, one of the things that I've been able to do is just seeing, um, it's kind of the same at church. I can like see the whole picture to me. It, it's just a whole picture and it's like different players, especially in a crisis. It's like, for me, I feel like the crisis is the same. The players are different. Yeah. And there have definitely been times where you're sitting in a room with an entire like command staff and the chief of police, and you're the only civilian and professional staff and female. And it's like, what do you think? And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, we need to blah, 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 blah. And he's like, yep, that's what we're doing. And I have literally walked out of the chief's office and gone back to my office into a closet like, Lord, please make sure that was the right thing I just told them to yeah. do. And so it just becomes, some people call it um, intuition, things that come very naturally, but it is the leading, it's gifting of the Holy Spirit. And and I have a girlfriend, <laughs> I have a girlfriend who goes, hold on, what did you just say? I have to write that down. And now we have a rule. You have to write it down when I first say it. Because I don't, remember <laughs> I don't know. This is just coming to me. And I'm just so grateful and so yeah. um, blessed that most of the time, I can't remember a time it didn't work, but yeah. And it's just like, I don't know. I don't say that anymore. I don't know how it's the leading of the Holy Spirit yeah. operating in your gifting, whether it's servant or inter um, or perceiver. And it's like, yeah. it's just coming to me. The Holy Spirit is like, let's do this. Let's do that. And then when people are like, oh, did you figure that out? I'm like, I honestly, it, wasn't me. it just, it just came out. Intuition is a good way to look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, really? That's a, just, just it's a, I don't think I've ever used that word to describe how I feel inside when it's like time to walk in your gifting. Hmm. I guess it could be yeah. a, I guess it's a very, um, natural way to, to explain it. It may be easier yeah. for people to think of it. Yeah. Un that understand way. it that way. Cause they, everybody's had yeah. an intuition of some sort Correct. and you can have it for any of the giftings regardless of what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Yeah. 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 And so, okay. So, uh, uh, speaking of crises though, you mentioned that. So you, 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 you tend to thrive and that's what, you know, so whether you're, you're 
in the newsroom, like you spent 15 mm-hmm. years, like you said, you know, like in the crisis is like, we have an, we have a show that's going to go on the air and we're still like filming it like five minutes before it goes mm-hmm. out. Like, you know, like that kind of crisis versus the time kind of crisis that you might face today, a, a shooting or something like that. And even more recently, we had to have a school shooting here in the St. Louis area right. and you were part of the communications, you know, mm-hmm. the, at least helping them get the, the word out and, right. you know, disseminate that information. Uh, what's that like for you uh, to walk into gifting in those, in those critical situations? Um, again, it's like something just turns on and it literally becomes for me a formula. What's next? Did we, it's like, did we, we did this here, here's the information that we have. What do we know? What are we putting out and how do we get to the next thing? So for example, um, I'm trying to think of one that's not as tragic, (laughs) but even with, um, Let's say if there's an officer involved uh, shooting and um, someone um, is killed or the officer is killed, um, I go into this, this, uh, it's, it's all work. And I think that came from news. Um, you, you are a little bit detached, but it's like, these are the things that have to get done. I think that's why moms are good at yeah. this kind of stuff, because it's like, we need to figure out where the family is, who's going to notify them once they are done. All right, now we notifying people in the department. And this is all before we yeah. have even notified the media. If there are questions coming in, how do we want to field those? Um, or have we built out a process to say, hey, A, B, C, and D have happened. Once we've kind of put a stamp on that part of the process, all right, what's next? Okay, now we need to prepare for uh, a press conference. Who's speaking? Who's going to be there? What are they going to say? What information are we releasing? Have we released it privately first to the uh, department and stakeholders before you don't want certain people learning certain things um, in in the public realm on the yeah. news? You you never want want that to happen. And then even after that, all right. So we've put this out. Where do we go from here? Because now the crisis crisis isn't over. Yeah. So it it just kind of all follows like this formula that I've been told the formula at least come out of my head and onto a piece of paper. Um, And so that's kind of just how I walk through things. It's the same thing. It's almost like being in television was a great example because I was a a news producer. So to me, it was all a script. You, you have the first block, second block, you got to put this in. And if there is something that is thrown in there that you weren't aware of, all right, you got to pivot. Yeah. You, you really do. So I can't really articulate why my brain it just works, works that way. Right? That way. Yeah. <laughs> but it is. And it's like getting where all we're doing is getting to the end. I remember when a police officer was shot in Baldwin, Missouri, and we went down to help them and had decided, all right, we're doing what we would consider nuts and bolts or the investigative part. And then um, you guys are going to do kind of the sentiment part and the community part because the investigation that's being handled needs that the information needs to be um, all uh, cohesive and yeah. the same. And then at one point I asked, all right, what's our end game? Because we can't stay here in Baldwin for the duration, but we can give you ways to go. How do we bring the community in on this? So they feel like they were a part, set something up to where there there's an out for everyone. How do we put this to bed? And so that's how I like to wrap things yeah. almost like a, like a newscast. And yeah. So this is a perfect example, by the way, for anybody listening, what you're describing a situation like, and you're having thoughts that none of us would have, like, this is a perfect example of what it looks like when you're walking in your gifting. Like you have the answer before anybody else. You have a usually a better answer than someone else in this particular area, you know, and you're able to be looked upon in a way where like, I, I picture like, like the mom, right? So the, the mom's in the kitchen and the phone's ringing and the dog's barking and you're feeding the kids laundry and you got the pot that's boiling over and you know, you're ba- able to manage all that. Meanwhile, yep, dad, wa- dad walks in and he's like, uh, <laughs> and, and he sort of stopped in his tracks. He's like, I don't know what to do. Yep. You know what I'm saying? And, and for anybody who's walking in their gifting, you just sort of see the picture you see I it do. <laughs> yep, you do. and it's such an interesting concept that yeah. uh, you know people may not understand that that's how god works in all of us yeah like to be able to walk into a situation regardless of what it is see what needs to be done and do it and then um, or help someone else do it yeah because yep. even that it's like uh when when i went down to the city shooting um i was a little thrown off because um one of the PIOs walked up to me and said, Hey, we got this, we got this, and we What's got a PIO? this public information officer. Okay. Uh, and then another walked up and said, Hey, I got this and that. And I was like, yep. And I'm a ghost. 
I'm going to do whatever you guys need me to do. And so it was mostly like, and they, they were doing a great job and it was like, um, did you think about this? Oh no, we did. Okay, great. Okay, cool. I got it. I can send that out yeah. for you. Okay. You, you want me to take care of this part for you? And that goes to like my surrogate. I just wanted to help. I knew that if I heard that call come out and I was looking at that on TV, my only thought was she's by herself. Cause I know the PIO in the city and I just felt like I can't just yeah. sit here yeah. and act just yeah. not do anything and i asked my deputy chief can i go to the city he was like yes go ahead and help and that part is just like i was just so glad to be able to help walk them through yeah. some things that they do well but you might forget this or less okay yeah that's a, a good way to do that so i just really appreciate that um being you know one of the giftings and i don't need an award i yeah. don't need like look y'all go do that I just wanted to help. <laughs> yeah, we, well, we can't boast in what God's given us. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, if I'm out there going, look what I did, y'all. Like, I missed the whole point of my Christian walk here. Yes, <laughs> that's that's true. And I think that may also be why it's hard for us to take, like, compliments yeah. and things like that. Because I compliment the, the, the police officers like, oh, my God, that was amazing. And for them, they're like, he just did Got our job. job. Yeah. And mostly, they're probably server gifts. Yeah. And so they're just like, it wasn't anything. And that's how I feel yeah. sometimes. That wasn't a big deal. I just, eh, it just yeah. happened. You you have to face really tough situations uh, because of the line of work that you're in, you know, mm -hmm. as far as the situations that are happening around you. Well, they yeah, do. They do. And I'm support. Cor <laughs> correct, yes. Yeah. So, but but the, the point is, is that, like, it, it, to keep sort of the understanding of the gifts going is, like, those hard situations, those difficult situations to walk in, like a school shooting, for instance, you know, it's tragic. Everybody is like, oh, my gosh. Like, yeah. we've sort of stopped everything. We're just paying attention to this. But most of us are just like, what do we do? And you you and others are able to walk into that situation. Yeah. Do what needs to be done in the midst of all the terribleness that has just taken place, mm -hmm. you know, and, and make the right calls and do the right things. And that's that's so hard. And, like, most of us don't experience, <laughs> you know, such difficult things on a daily basis or to be yeah. surrounded by difficult things that are happening on a daily basis. So for you, does that like seep into your life, your soul or like your heart, like, like having seen so many, you know, yeah. Difficult so, things? um, I first noticed that working in news, yeah. um, because again, I'm very sensitive. And what I noticed was, um, I was, looking for things to happen like i knew that i was like all right we might need to take a look at this possible anxiety when i was sitting at a gas pump yeah. one day and my um my former husband was pumping gas and christian he so i think he was in a in a, a a car seat and i was sitting there thinking if a fire started at the gas pump what would be the quickest way for me to get him um out of the car how would i do that and huh. that's when i said okay look wait a second <laughs> because I had got used to yeah. walking through, how do you get through this? So you, ha you have to have a balance. And that's where my walk with Christ came yeah. in. And I had to remember, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication because I was becoming anxious. Yeah. I was becoming anxious. Everything was gonna be tragedy. It was one of the reasons I was very glad that I got out of um, news because it wasn't just uh, what's happening in St. Louis County. It was what's happening around the world yeah. and you're, you're always kind There's of- There's no break. There was not a break and it was always like high level. Like you gotta get this out. You gotta find the next bad thing. And there are lots of great news organizations and we do try to find good stories and that stuff, but it is not the thing that yeah. people are looking for it selling. It leads, they say. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I really had to ask God to help me find a way to um, become a, a little bit detached because even afterwards, excuse me, um, there's still something, there's still something there that you want to go pray. You want to go cry. Mm. You just saw this stuff. And so I actually had to learn, um, through one of our chaplains <laughs> at oh, the yeah? police department. I was like, I don't know what's wrong with me. He's like, Vera, you may have PTSD. And I felt like <gasps> I yeah. don't have the right to. Yeah. And he was like, why you see the same thing. The officers see you read those reports, you do this, you do that. And I had to learn to take the time. And because when I'm working, I'm like, bam, 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 yeah. bam. Nothing's affecting me. And then a month later, I'm like crying when I hear mm -hmm. a song and it's like, oh, 
So learning to help ask God to, hey, help me to um, take this off of me, to operate in my gift, but also learn how to um, to let it go and that your will be done. And this is this is, you know, kind of how I had to learn to use, you know, all of the things that God has given us and you put all cast all your cares on him and let some stuff go. Yeah. I mean, I've been to the hotel room. I've seen the fire emergency chart on the door, but I don't give it much thought. But you're living in a world where you walked in and say, oh, my gosh, it's a fire. There's going to be a fire. And this was sort of the PTSD sort of that you would be walking in a little bit. Or I would, I'm like me, I walk in, I'm like, all right, I know where the exits oh. are. <laughs> like I the need born, a The born situation, the born identity. <laughs> right. <laughs> Got my, hand, my back to the wall. Uh, you mentioned Christian. Christian's your son. So you grew up in a family of all boys, and then you had two boys. Uh-huh. And so uh, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about Cam. And mm-hmm. I, I think his story can be quite an encouragement to somebody. So uh, t- give us give us the sort of the rundown on your family. Okay, so I have um, Christian and Cameron are my sons. Uh, I have two boys. Christian is eighteen. He is in in college now, and Cameron is um, thirteen. Um, we uh, there. I'm no longer married uh, to their dad, and. I spent a lot of time, I think it was maybe like four years, just like doing like single mom thing and yeah. trying to raise boys and probably just like kept them covered up. <laughs> just <laughs> not the thing you should be doing with boys. You should definitely, you know, um, you know, uh, ha- have some male some presence and someone who's going to say, um, you know, no, you, they, you need to kick their butt. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but he's so cute. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, uh, having been in news, having, you know, work in a high stress job, I was very like, don't go anywhere. Don't do this. Mm-hmm. And, and so I may have created them to be somewhat anxious. And so when I recognized that I really had to try to turn the page with the boys huh. like okay um thank god my for my husband my current husband who came into my life and was really uh, a big help with that but at one point um cameron became it was 2020 and i think a lot of it had to do with he's a very social kid mm-hmm. cameron is the one he's like hey I'm Cameron. You want to play? And <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm Vera and you are a stranger. <laughs> I'm going back in the house. He's very, um, he's just very. Stranger danger. Yeah. He's very outgoing, loves doing videos, has his own YouTube channels. Yeah. And he just does all of this stuff. And at some point, um, there was um, an incident where he had gotten like really, really afraid um, and we think it turned into something called, um, they started off with AMPS, Amplified Musculoskeletal Pain Syndrome. And the doctors were like, well, we don't, we're not really sure what this is, but it had to do with how his mind was processing either fear, anxiety, and um, how it was showing up in his body. Because on the outside, it was like, he was just like this happy-go-lucky kid, but something was stressing him out. At the same time, and I'm not, definitely not yeah. trying to get into any type of conspiracies or anything yeah. he did um he did get sick and this was during COVID, and so uh, amps and f and d are sparked by typically an injury an illness or some sort of um psychosomatic like re- like something you just got really scared and it was like it, you went into protective mode like shock or something mm-hmm. right and so over the um, last, I guess it was about two years, we were kind of walking through this thing like we didn't know what was going on and he would just be in pain and I would take him to doctors and they're like, well, we don't know what this is. And then um, it just like progressed. And there were some outside stressors that God really had to help us with and start to recognize, all right, you know, you aren't doing what I'm telling you to do in terms of being communicative with their father and creating environments where they had to be the first priority. And I mean, there had to be just like a come to Jesus, like the adults need to be adults because Mm -hmm. this is effective. And I think divorce has a huge effect on kids. Um, but you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And so you, then you just ask God to, to just really help you. Um, through some things. So with Cameron, um, we, I started to see things like at one point he, it started when he couldn't open his mouth to eat. 
like couldn't open his mouth. Then he lost his ability to like speak. And then he wouldn't be able to like see or hear. And he was losing all. And I'm like, what is this? And no one could tell me. First off, how scary? Oh my God. It is very scary. Not only is it scary for me, a normal, but normal kid. And all of a sudden, yep. All, all these things it, start to happen. Yep. And it was like getting progressive. And I'm like, wow, no one can tell me like he couldn't walk. And so I remember when I was so tired of going to doctors and hospitals and he just like, he was like having some sort of like a panic attack or something. And he was stiff as a board and he couldn't talk. And I put him in the car and I said, God, tell me where to go because I had been going to, you know, primary care physician. Oh, it might be this. It might be. And I'm like, please help me. Tell me where to go. And I was on 70 eastbound. And I'm like, I, you got to tell me where to go. And the Holy Spirit said, mercy children's. And I was like almost about to pass 270. <laughs> and it's like 1030 at night. And I'm like, all right, we're going to mercy children's. And I got there. And I, at this point, I'm like, this is what I can tell you is going on. Yeah. I don't know what's wrong with him, but this happened, this happened, this happened. And the ER doctor says, I don't know what this is, but we have a doctor here. I need you to go see him. He probably can help you. And that was my first like, thank you, Lord. Mm. So we go see that doctor after they've gotten Cameron calmed down and they, you know, uh, have put him on um, some pain medication, but we're like, I don't think this is medi the pain medicine doesn't help. And so once he's calm, we can kind of get him moving, but he wasn't walking. We were using wheelchairs and everything. And when we got back to that, we went to this next doctor and he said, uh, I think this is amps amplified musculoskeletal pain syndrome and started to kind of open the door to what is that and it's neurological and here's some of the treatment and and uh, he said he said something i had never heard before but in the middle of this, this is god uh in between appointments we have someone who goes to our church her name is shirley and she is wonderful shirley vaughn and she kind of knew what was going on she goes you need to come to children's and see dr abishan and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to get you an appointment because she works over there or whatever. And this doctor in a different hospital network uh -huh. tells me, you may want to go down to children's to pain management. I didn't put two and two together until I'm like, all right, this is who they want me to call. So I call and they're like, this is Dr. Yeah. Abishan's office. And I'm like, oh, oh. thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and so... So I'm like, all right, Holy Spirit, if we're on the right track, because yeah. now I'm in like, whatever it is that we have to do, we're going to do it. And it took me a minute because for a long time, it was like, you just crying. You mm -hmm. just like, oh Lord, mm. why is this happening to me? And, oh. and my husband was very, um, he was just very instrumental in, hey, you have to say what you want to see. And so because he was- Say that again. <laughs> you have to say what you want to see. Yeah. And so um, I was learning very quickly, I have to speak these things and you cannot be passive. And he is not the passive type. So it no, was like, always... oh my goodness, he is not passive. He's like, these doctors, this we'll and that. And, this. and I'm like, okay, hold on. But we're going to walk through the process. But had to become so indignant in my faith. I knew- that Cameron would not always be that way. But I knew that in this moment, this is hard for him. We would, we had gotten to the point, John, where I was working from home because Cameron, in any given morning, he wouldn't be able to walk or he'd wake up and he couldn't see. That's crazy. He'd wake up and he couldn't talk. And we were finding- It's not just one thing. It's a variety of different issues. Some days it would be one thing. Some days it would be another thing. How hard was, I mean, you're um, like, I got this figured out. Maybe I can do this for him. And the next day, correct. Different. And the next day it was something different. And they were like, yep, this is functional neurological disorder. And this is kind of what it looks like. And to the point where when he lost all his senses, I was only communicating with him through taps. We had come up with taps. Like, do you need to be, he lost there? all of them. Yeah. And in the evenings, if he was too um, anxious, um, it was, we had to do things like, all right, we had to do kind of like tempered breathing to bring, to just relax him, but he wouldn't be able to see, he wouldn't be able to hear or speak. And so 
those were the I think those were the worst nights and I would use like melatonin so that he could go to sleep because the next morning he would at least regain some of his sen 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 um, senses yeah. and so in those times um, if he couldn't see or hear or speak I would use taps okay um, and we would use um, like air pods because with functional neurological disorder and they call it functional neurological symptomatic disorder you don't lose those symptoms they're temporarily turned off the your brain and your body are not communicating properly because something is going we're in trouble there's there's something blocking the yeah. signals so we would use things like airpods because the airpod worked almost like a hearing aid on listening mode so he could at least hear us a little bit so when he had some of those senses back it would relax him but I'm talking about wheelchairs, walkers. We could for a 13 year old boy who was fine, you know. A month oh ago. yeah, I mean he could be fine one day running around playing, and then he would go and get in the shower and collapse in the shower. How scary! And you're right, and I can't yeah. lift, so we got to go in, lift him out, dry him up, and and so um, just oh my god, walking through that, I became so adamant in in i am going to say what i believe i am not going to be um um distracted in my faith in the closet because every day was something different and it was like now i'm crying now i'm this but it was like still like you know um his god said it i believe it is mm. settled so when we finally got a, a good um di uh, diagnosis the doctors at children said we we could probably take care of this here it's gonna be a while but we think you should go to um to a program that we sent people so a couple kids to they had like four kids in the whole area mm -hmm. who were challenged with this four yeah very rare not for that said, hospital four total right correct so we get to children's and they say you know hey we we can handle this through physical therapy and all these things um but we think you should probably go to Johns Hopkins to Kennedy Krager for an inpatient program. By that time, me and his dad and Alan are like, "What? Whatever we need <laughs> to do, let's <laughs> let's let's go do it." And so, um, I we call up there, and they're like, "Well, we can. You can. You have to fly up here for an for an outpatient uh, 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 appointment, and then you go back home and then you wait to see if you're even accepted into wow. the program and it was like okay fine and my husband always says we'll have everything we need when we need it and so we went up for the initial visit and they said yeah um you definitely qualify we can get you back in in january and i'm like january that is just so you know far away because i think this is like september and i'm just like oh yeah. my goodness we have to wait all this time for this um for, for us to get back in and maybe it was October. I'm trying, I'm like trying to keep this oh, timeline yeah. straight. So it doesn't matter if it's 10 days away, you correct. got a son who you're communicating with and by now, tapping on his hand. Right. And we're walking and, and we're learning some things yeah. and doing physical therapy and just walking in a few things. And part of something else I was dealing with then was submission and uh, obedience. Yeah. And yesterday would have been one year to the day where, um, the Lord had told me to say something to like a public official. And I'm like, that makes no sense. Right. I'm not saying that to him. <laughs> I'm not doing God, that. God, you miss, you were supposed to talk <laughs> to somebody else. I know. <laughs> and so I was supposed to say this thing, you know, it was just really like on me, like you got to do this. And we were at an event together and I saw him and Holy Spirit was like, tell him. And I'm like, oh man. So I walked over and I was like, hey. I don't know what this means. I'm being obedient. I'm going to tell you A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay. I'm like, exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and go on about my business. Thank God he was cool. <laughs> the next day is Veterans Day. And I'm off work and I'm at home. And I get a call from Johns Hopkins. And I have a lady on the phone who tells me, she says, hey, um, we have a spot for Cameron. Can you be here on Monday? And I'm like, yes, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's the truth, right, yeah. but I'm going to say yeah. yes. And this is like a Thursday in 2021 <laughs> 
one year to probably this day yeah. that I'm sitting here with you yeah. and I say, yes. And I immediately, she goes, okay, I'm going to call some people. We're going to call you back. I said, I got to call his dad. I got to call my husband. And, um, you know, and I'm immediately like, oh my God, I've been doing this obedience thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was not the only case where I was like, all right, let me Whatever. do what the Lord <laughs> tell me to do because I don't know. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my God, I just, you know, I just got this call. We're supposed to go in January. And yeah. now they're saying, can you be here Monday? So I get on the phone with his dad, with my husband, and then my lieutenant from work. Now, Alan says, we'll have everything we need when we need it. I don't yeah. know how we get into Baltimore. We going to do it. Ain't no if, ands, buts about it. We going for it. My lieutenant from work calls and says, and he had told me earlier, you know, the foundation wants to do something for you. We're working something out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so nice. You don't really even need to do that for me. Um, and he calls and he says, Hey, um, you know, uh, we, um, uh, we just wanted to let you know, because by this time my job didn't know we had an appointment for January. Um, and he said, we want to let you know that, uh, the foundation came up with $8,000 for you to shut up, take to <laughs> yes, to whatever you need to take care of camera and blah, blah, blah. And I'm I like, love Jesus. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm like LT. We have to be there on Monday. They just called and blah, blah, blah. He goes, and he was like, okay, you going to be at work tomorrow? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think so. He was like, so that was a Friday. So this yeah. was on a Thursday. And he, I said, yeah, he goes, all right, we'll have a check for you when you get just there. Just waiting on the door. And I was like, <laughs> That's amazing. can you write an $8,000 check and just hand it to someone? And I'm thinking, even when I take this to cash it, are they going to hold it for yeah. 10 days? I don't know. Yeah. And I was just oh, so amazed by God get on the phone with the nurse and everything and they're like all right well you guys have to do um COVID testing in order to get into the program but yeah. you need to be here by Monday we're going to admit you on Tuesday and the Lord just um just walked through that and on Sunday I'd be remiss to mention because you have people in the group in church where it's like like Miss Lo Lo well, Lawanu was going on Pastor yeah. Simeon because we're really good friends. And of course, I told Pastor Tracy, who's been like walking through this, right. and I'm on a group text. I'm like, guess what? We're going to. Yeah. From the Spirit Church. We go yes, to Spirit from Church the Spirit together. Church. So anybody's Sorry. confused. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> we're, this is where we're going. And um, the church handed us a check for $2,000. Like, hey, uh, $10,000 in two days. We will have everything we need when we need it. And I just thank God for that. And, and it did not, it, I was not lost on the fact that it started with obedience. Yeah. It started with obedience and an indignant faith to go, we are going to do everything that God told us to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to walk this out and I'm going to say what I believe. And so we went to Johns Hopkins up to Kennedy Krieger, great people who were really able to give us some tools. I had to be separated from cameras. So I'm in a hotel room crying, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> and it was expensive. This whole trip was expensive, was blessed to spend some time in the Ronald McDonald house and really just see, oh my God, what they do for families to the point where I'm like, I want to do that. When I get back to St. Louis, I want to help out yeah. our Ronald McDonald houses here. And then to just be able to come out of that. I took that child up there in a wheelchair. Yeah. And we came back walking by the grace of God with some tools in our pocket. <laughs> I think one of the funniest things as we got there, we got to the airport and Cameron goes, I hope this Dr. Hopkins knows what he's doing. And I <laughs> said, what? He goes, you know, I said, no, you're going to Johns Hopkins is the name of the hospital. And nice. he goes, oh, me and granny been messing that up all week. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But just to come back and to be able to get the help that we needed um, with, and even with uh, his mentality and getting the doctors um, that were, there's one FND, one FND occupational therapist here in St. Louis. Wow. And by the time I got back, it was like, all right, now you can get on to her service. And God's just been just amazing in that front. But even being able to witness to Cameron who at the time he's like, I don't know why this is happening to me. And it would make him sad and just sure. encouraging him. And we're going to say, you know, um, 
Uh, we have things to do. F and D is not going to stop me from recording and doing my videos and knowing that he has God has a plan for his life and yeah. even the responsibility of you softening my husband's heart, um, not towards Cameron, but to go. Okay, I need to kind of you know be supportive and fall in line with. Look, we're not going through this crazy stuff and arguing. Not the two of us, but you know, yeah. just bringing in other other members of the family is like, here's what we're doing. We're all going to walk this out together. And I'm just very grateful and just being very yes. And a man yeah. about that taught me that we have to be like that in all things. You pray about all things and be just that indignant about, okay, God, you said that this is in the plan for my life. You said in your word that if I ask and believe this is going to happen. So, you know, take God to task yeah. and go, Hey, yep. You did it before. You're going to do it again. And that all started John with little miracles, yeah. little, little faith moments. Like I prayed this two years ago and he showed up right away. Why is this any different? Cause it's bigger. I was in the hospital room one night and I was just praying and worshiping and going through some things. And the devil was like, that don't work. And it didn't work this time. You in the hospital, why? And I'm real. I literally, and I mean, I had like some worship music on and I got upset. I was like, Oh, you going to come for me. I'm going to do this even more. Yep. And I'm not going to give it. And I remember that's different than the devils in your light bill. That's different. That is very different. <laughs> and I just remember the Lord gave me this, gave me this message. And I started just thinking about you. Yeah. Pull out the things in your toolbox. I'm in this hospital. And you know what? I didn't stay and I'm in the hospital and I'm praying for Cameron. And I started praying for the other kids in children's hospital right oh. there because, oh, you coming for me. I'm going to pray for everybody on the <laughs> They're floor. They're all getting out of here. I'm Jesus like, name. Yep. I, I went straight Christian hood. Well, we not going to do. <laughs> you not going to tell me that prayer don't work. And I'm praying for the kid next door. And I'm praying for this. And everybody in here is here. And if yes. it and just to become, I was never like that before. Okay. I, I was very meek and oh, I don't know if I should pray a lot. Yeah. And it, it was such an experience that the Lord had to teach me the power that was inside. Again, why are we doing this? What are we doing this for? If we, if we not see a results, what are we doing here? Yeah. And so you have to remember that in all things. And it's not always easy. Yeah. And sometimes you're like, Oh, I hurt my finger. Girl, pray for your finger and keep it moving. And it gave me the faith to tell other people, who are, who may be like, or some of the ladies I talked to who may be like, okay, uh, well, this happened and that happened. And I want y'all to pray for me and pray for me this and pray for me. And I'm so glad the Lord, and I think you should ask people to pray when two touch and agree, mm -hmm. you know, things can be done. But to remind people, you can do this yourself. You have the same power. Someone had called and was like, can I come lay hands on you? And I'm like, no, I'm good. You know, because I knew and I wasn't being funny. It was like, no, we, we, we are literally good. No, we, we got it. God's in control. And yeah. so, um, just to be able to develop that through this walk and now for Cameron to go, I go, do you know where you were last year? He goes, yeah. I said, do you know, do you think that it's different than God helping? And he goes, yeah. Cause back then it was just like, I don't know what's going on. He was 12, yeah. you know? So now for him to start to see, okay. And, and I'm how's just, he doing now? Cameron's doing great. <laughs> Cameron's doing great. We have very uh, minimal, what I would call minimal symptoms of functional neurological disorder. And he's learned tools to deal with them and to go, you know what? I'm doing good. I'm fine. I'm keep this moving. And I mean, when I say minimal, I mean like minimal, like I got, he got soap in his eyes one night. He was like, I have soap in my eyes. And so his brain thinks it's in danger. And so now it's like, yes, you have soap in your eyes and now you don't and you're fine. And I, by the time I walk out of the room, he can see. So it's, it is the craziest thing. You want to get scared, look up FNSD or FND. Oh, <laughs> I can't imagine. Like, how did you even like function? Like you've been in tough situations in your job, but this is your son. Um, probably the same way. You don't think about it. You have to do it. Yeah. You, and, and I, it came to a point where I realized I was the only person who had to do this with him. Everybody else could opt out and could be like, oh, okay, well, she got it. Or I had to do it and I had to do it for him because I knew that this would not be forever. I knew that he, I know he has a gifting. Yeah. This kid sees things. I think you were in broadcast journalism or yeah. a communications yeah. degree. He, he sees things and records things and, and visualizes video. And I'm like, that I've never seen before. I'm like, what made you choose that shot? And he's like, I don't know. It was a good shot. And I'm like, <laughs> I went to J school. 
And so it was my responsibility as his mother, as a believer, and as um, just a, as as a human. Hey, we're we're gonna walk this out. I couldn't think about it. There were lots of tears, lots of crying. Yeah. When I got him to Baltimore to Kennedy Kreiger or Johns Hopkins, that's when I felt like I was just like done. I just cried in the hotel yeah. room, but I thanked God for pointing us in the direction and having the courage to walk it out. Because yeah. at any point I could have been like, we can't afford that. We can't do that. Oh. Uh, can we just do it here in St. Louis? Because I used to be that passive. Yeah. And so it's sort just of settling for your circumstances. Correct. Because you didn't know any better. Yeah. Well, this is what they told us. So it's my cross my, to bear now. Yeah, yeah. But my husband was having none of that. That's amazing. See, go that, see somebody <laughs> else. Go do this. No, we go. And even in some of the things that he did one day, Cameron was, you know, using crutches. And I'm like, well, he can't move. He's got to use crutches. And one day Alan walked in and he was like, hey, we're not doing the crutches anymore. And he, he said that to Cameron very nicely. And took the crutches Cameron walks Cameron walks <laughs> it's like this that's, that's all right Lazarus <laughs> yeah. that like what you have experienced and what I think the takeaway is for anybody here is what faith looks like like faith to faith glory to glory oh there God. are different levels of faith and when you start to walk in them whether it's by necessity or mm -hmm. by desire I think that you can begin to see God move mountains in your life, uh, whether it's trying to get over something or dealing with a, a situation like this, which is the, the, the negative health of your, your loved one. Mm -hmm. I mean, faith, like you said, you've been in church your whole life and you, and you started saying, this is the first time I thought like this, the first time I did this, this you know, it's like you stepped out on a new level. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I really give a lot of, of that credit, um, to God but also getting into a ministry that was a teaching ministry. So when you grow up as a, a preacher's kid, you grow up in church, it's like, okay, you hear all these things or whatever, and maybe you have some applicable knowledge, but really getting into a place where they were like, okay, no, this is how you apply this. We're gonna get into foundational truths. And once you pray, leave it there uh -huh. and then do this and then do that and and no matter what happens so we got into a ministry where it was like it was about walking it out and so when it came time it wasn't like all right i need everybody to pray for me because yeah. i'm this victim and i was like nope this what we finna do i say that because that's just <laughs> i use a little swing yeah, this hey. what we finna do and that's what you did and look yeah. what happened look at the results of it and so and forth. then apply it to everything else it's like you know what this is a difficult situation that's relational yeah. and it has to do with people why don't you think he would work the same way just because this is invisible or it's one of those like yeah. things where it feels like, well, we can't, this can never work. It's like, nope, we're going to apply the same principles, say what you want to see yeah. and start to rebuke Satan's attempt at division and all those things. Yeah. It's like, okay, here, this is what we going to do. Yeah. I, the, you know, what's the analogy? Like a high tide lifts all boats or whatever, you know, like. When, I've never heard that before, when, John. When, <laughs> it's okay. You know, uh, when you, when that happens though. Like if, if that's your level of faith that you've not risen, like all the areas of faith in your other life, like how much easier is it to deal with, you know, things that used to be sort of difficult to deal with. And now it's just like, I ain't nothing no or more. Or things <laughs> you used to freak out about. It was yeah. like, Ooh, and now I'm like, girl, calm down. Yeah. Where are we going? This is what we doing. And that's what Jesus was trying to teach the disciples. Like, you don't know what's yeah. coming, but you're going to get there. You know, how so good. Uh, anybody, uh, Oh man, I'm, I'm so excited that you share this story because I think it's really going to help people. I really do. I really believe that people who are, you know, dealing with things, uh, it's difficult to understand what to do in the moment, mm -hmm. but you gave some practical application oh, for, good. <laughs> for how to deal with a really difficult thing. I mean, if my kid woke up today and couldn't move, I know not like I got to look, we're, we're declaring this now we're getting yeah. on our knees now and we're not going to settle for less. We're not just going to be like, well, let's just go buy the wheelchair, what, you know, like, yeah. and be done with it. We're going to believe that God will show up at the right time with the things that we need because it was expensive. It, 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 like $10,000 showed up on your doorstep mm -hmm. when you were not even expecting it. Nope. Not at all. And only God can do stories like this. And so when anytime I hear stories like this, I, I say God can't, you can't make this stuff up all the time because when God's in it, you can't make up the results. You, you're correct. And the, the, the great part about that is. I've began taking pleasure in things that only God can get the credit for. Yeah. 
I mean, even if it's little stuff, even if it's the mindset change of someone where I got on my knees and I prayed and I'm like, okay, this is not something I can handle. I'm asking you for this. So help me to do what I'm supposed to do while you work on that person. And then there's a, I knew it wasn't me. And it's like, only God could do that. Only God. All right, Ms. Fear, thanks for being on the show with me today. Thanks, John. Was that okay? Y'all, this is, this is awesome. So uh, thanks, everybody, for watching uh, today's show. Don't forget to check out, uh, most recently, we had a, uh, a long-form uh, testimonial documentary that if you haven't watched yet, uh, it's called uh, Two Hard Roads to Jesus. We want you to go check that video out. But uh, until next time, guys, we pray you discover a future and a hope for your life today.